Hi, welcome again to Ivory Tower Collections. I uh, wanted to show you a newest add-on to the collection today. Um, not so much because I'm just trying to show additional stuff here, but mainly because I can't really find a whole lot about this thing. Um, for basically just to get this part out of the way, it's essentially a Pong console from as near as I can tell, roughly around 1976. Um, it was distributed by JCPenney, which you can't really see here. So let me move this box up a little bit. There we go. It's distributed by JCPenney originally. And all I know about it is that it's called the Electronic 4-in-1 TV Game. Now, again, this is basically a Pong, con Pong console clone. There were a ton of these in the 70s. After Atari released their original home version of Pong, and once the uh, technology from individual discrete components was able to be simplified into a single chip, uh, then they were everywhere. And this does use a single chip or Pong on a chip uh, setup. Um, like most consoles, it offered four basic variations, the, which they called here hockey, tennis, uh, squash, and handball. And basically, in a nutshell, hockey is just that. One player controls one set of paddles, another player controls another set of paddles, and you try to get the ball from uh, into your opponent's goal point. Tennis is standard pong like anything else. Squash is basically racquetball. And then handball is basically racquetball for one, hence why it also says practice underneath it. Um, so why did I pick this up? Well, for one, I got it for a really good price. At least I think I got it for a good price. Um, it was right at about $20 shipped to me. Uh, and it's complete in the box, as you can see. Now the box is a little rough. It's got some tape on it, some tears, and obviously been stored away for a while. The flap on the top is, is broken off and it's got some stain marks on it. But otherwise, it's in very sturdy shape. I also got it because of the unique look of the console itself. A lot of Pong units uh, looked fairly similar or tried to mimic that of Atari's uh, configuration. This one's a little bit different in that it has more of a, I guess you could say more of a minimalist and modern look to it at the same time. It really doesn't scream too much the 70s and more like the 80s to me given that it does have this black and silver uh, frame to it. Uh, the knobs are not detachable, and all of the controls are handled with uh, aluminum anodized flip switches within the center of it, which is really kind of neat. So yeah, let me uh, take it out and show it to you up front. I've now removed the uh, system from the box it was in, and you can see all the styrofoam is still in place, and as near as I can tell, all the original components are still with it as well. Um, I did add some additional cable ties to the RF cord here so that it would fit in its spot a little more neat and tidy. Um, also, the power supply, I'm pretty sure is the original power supply. It's not branded the same as everything else, but it has the exact same specs. And um, unlike a lot of other Pong consoles back in the day, which could essentially use an Atari 2600 type power supply with a little eighth inch headphone uh, jack mono type uh, connection, this actually uses a two and a half millimeter or two and a half by five millimeter barrel jack, uh, almost exactly like the Sega Genesis, Master System, and Jaguar did. Um, in fact, uh, if the polarity is to be believed, you could actually use one of those power supplies on this unit. But it still has this one and it still works just fine. So I've got it tied up there as well. It's also got this rather large RF box, this game switch box like uh, they used to use quite a bit back in the day. You can see it's a little tarnished on top, not quite rusted, but getting close. And everything is imprinted as far as the words go within the uh, aluminum housing. Uh, it's very unusual in that it's got uh, two different sets of screw terminals here. And as near as I can tell, due to the differences in televisions back then between your standard aerial antenna and maybe like using a, a cable box converter, uh, one side is essentially for use with a cable box and the other side is for use specifically with an aerial antenna or rabbit ears as it was. So yeah, haven't tried this box, uh, didn't really need to, um, but it seems constructed well enough. In fact, the uh, double-sided sticky foam pad has not had the original tape removed, so <laughs> I guess it's still sticky? Hard to say. We are talking, you know, 40 years here. So yeah, uh, power supply again. It's gonna be kind of hard to get out of there. Like a lot of systems back in the day, it's got a tremendous amount of wire. Um, again, homes back then were, hence also two prongs, 
uh, didn't have outlets on every single wall like we do today. So they were thinking about that back then. And the 2600 is, is the same way, by the way, in that uh, they assumed you'd have to plug the actual power like on an opposing wall way far from the console. So you'd end up with like a 15, almost a 20 foot plus power cord. Uh, but anyway, so as you can see, it just uses like a two and a half by five millimeter barrel jack, like I said, seems to be a uh, center tip negative and uh, it runs on uh, nine volts and 200 milliamps. So not enough to power a 2600 or any other modern console today, but uh, it's the exact specs and requirement for what this unit needs. So let me go ahead and get some things taken out here and we'll remove it from the box. The box is actually cut in a wedge or not the box, but the styrofoam rather, is actually cut in a wedge design, which allows you to essentially lift it up and off. And I'm not sure what these big three holes are here. I was thinking maybe they were like grabs, but yeah, that's what I'm using them for. And there we are, the Pong unit itself. Yes, it still has the instructions. Again, it just says four in one TV game by JC Penny. The instruction manual is very sparse. It's got your usual 70s like uh, cartoon like graphics in it. Uh, words about the basic or just tells you the basic functionality of, of how to hook it up and how to operate it and what the different modes of the games are. It can run on either uh, batteries or on AC and they say UM2 battery. Uh, if I remember correctly and looking at this, I believe that's basically C cell batteries. So it takes essentially six C batteries uh, if you want to use it on battery power. Um, I'm just going to have it plugged off of its AC when I fire it up later. And then again, more stuff uh, specifically about the different games. Nowhere on here is there any information relating to the exact year it was made. Not on the box, not anywhere on this, not on the console that I could find. Uh, very difficult to track down. What I ended up doing to get a basic idea of when this was made was, and let me go ahead and remove it from the box here, so from the rest of the styrofoam so we can see it in all of its glory. Okay, so here it is removed from the box and uh, just wanted to go over briefly uh, the controls and, and how it's designed. So again, this is really unique, interesting looking version of a Pong console in that it's got this black and silver look to it, which is more modern than you would expect from 1976. And by the way, just so you can, just so I can advise you, here's how I'm essentially guessing it was made in 1976. Again, the documentation that came with it has nothing uh, as far as any date or years stamped on it at all. So what I did was, is I went ahead and took it apart and the Pong on a chip, chip itself, appears to have a date stamp from the 34th week of 1976, which would put it at roughly about the second to, about the second week or second to last week of August or the third week of August uh, from 1976. The other interesting thing about this, and I, this could, this is pure speculation and guessing, but if we take a look at the serial number, and I'll see if I can and, uh, focus in on that. I'm going to guess there weren't that many of these units made. Certainly not as many requiring that large a serial number. So my guess on this is that the first five or six digits here is probably the actual day it was made. 1976. September 4th is my guess, and that this is actually console unit number 9009. Now, again, I'm completely guessing here, but if you were to think of those first six digits as a date for the machine, which isn't that unusual to use for a serial number system, um, it does fall along the lines. If the chip was made in the 34th week of 1976, which was August of 76, then this would mean that the console itself was built on September 4th. 1976, which would have been just a few weeks after the chip that's inside of it was made or manufactured. So that could be fairly realistic. Um, again, it's just guesswork and speculation. I can't find any other year marks on this thing at all. The only other identifying marks is that it was originally made by Phoenix International Incorporated, and it does have a model number of 617-6000, but when I tried to Google any of this information, I came up with absolutely nothing. It does have a catalog number that shows 917-1349. Again, I can't find a reference to that number anywhere. And then it shows a uh, 
FCC type approval number called TB-204. I didn't try to look that one up, but it's possible I might get something on that. And then, you know, it talks about the usual stuff, valid only when operated pursuant to FCC rules, etc., etc. Serial number does have a channel selector switch. I'll zoom this back out. A little bit. It does have a channel selector switch under the battery cover. And again, the uh, battery cover takes six C cell batteries. Yeah, it's it's completely immaculate inside. It doesn't, I don't think it's ever had the batteries ever put in it. The actual battery or the actual channel selector switch is probably not going to pick up on the camera, but it's recessed down inside this hole. There's a tiny little uh, slider switch. Oh, there, it's just barely showing up uh, that allows you to switch between channels three and four. So, yeah, it's uh, that's about as much as I can tell you about it, as far as I know. Um, so, yeah, what about the comp control panel options? Well, you can see that obviously the paddle knobs are static. They do not come off, so obviously the players would have to huddle over it on a coffee table to use it. Uh, here's the power switch, which is this cool little toggle, metal switch toggle. Here's your bat size to change between a small or a larger bat. They call it long and short. You got your ball speed to change between a fast and slow ball. You have the game selector switch right here in the center to switch between hockey, tennis, squash, and practice. Uh, you have a big serve button here, clearly marked. You have uh, the angle switch, which is marked as amateur and pro. And about the only thing I've been able to determine with this is that amateur just has simplified angles that the ball bounces from, whereas pro uh, is more intricate and it's more sensitive to where it hits on the paddle to where it will bounce. And then you have your serve function, which you can set up for auto serve or manual. Basically the difference being exactly what it sounds like. If it's in manual mode, then the next ball will only come out when someone presses the serve button. If it's in auto mode, then the ball will basically serve itself after one or two seconds has passed from the last ball that was just lost. And then you have a big reset button here. So yeah, that's basically the uh, unit's top cover and operation. Let me show you some gameplay footage next. So here we are, I'm getting ready to power the console on, and again, I apologize, I don't really have a way to show both. Uh, it's, it's RF only, so we're, we're kind of limited to that. Uh, but it does produce a pretty nice picture. So I've got my TV on channel three, ready to go. I'm gonna flip the console on, and there we are. And I currently have it in just basic, um, uh, just in basic table tennis mode right now. So, um, do a quick reset. Now you can see <laughs> that for whatever reason, we already have the ball bouncing over there. Not real sure why. I think that's just to give us an indication that, that it's ready to go. But the interesting and cool thing about this is, is that the paddles on this, they may be 40 years old, but there's not a lot of jitter to them. I mean, I've got 2,600 paddles that don't work this well, even after a good thorough cleaning. So this is pretty impressive actually. And uh, I'm not sure how in focus that is. Let me see if I can get that in better focus. There we go. Also reduce the contrast down a bit. There we go. That's a lot better, isn't it? Okay. So let me just go through the different game modes real quick. Uh, right now you see the paddles in long form. That's the way they look when you shorten them up. So literally half the length. Uh, here's the ball speed currently. If I move it to fast, you can see that it does move quite a bit faster. Uh, changing the amateur to pro angle switch isn't going to do anything on this particular section yet, but it's kind of hard to demonstrate it anyway. And then we have the serve function, which is currently in manual mode. If I had this in auto, it would automatically be tossing the ball out as soon as we start a game. So let me just start with uh, trying to play a horrible uh, version of uh, tennis here, or actually I'll just go ahead and put it straight to hockey. So here's hockey. You got two paddles controlled by one player and two by the other, and obviously you want to get the ball into the opposing goal. And yes, occasionally it looks like I may need to get some uh, cleaner on the uh, switches here because occasionally a ghosted paddle will appear like that. So one player actually ends up with three instead of two. I don't know if it would actually register. My guess is it might. But uh, for now, we'll just try to keep it off of there. Okay, so here we go. Let's go ahead and serve the ball. Oh, that was bad, wasn't it? Let me try again. Oh, 
Ooh. So as you can see, very plain graphics, basic, basic beeps and boops. That's really about all there is to these games. And as near as I can tell, first player to 15 points wins um, on any of the games. So yeah, first one to, to get to 15 is, is declared the winner. So that's hockey. And then of course we have standard uh, pong, which is uh, just your normal tennis here. And this is normal pong. Now, you'll notice that I've switched the game modes, but the score has remained the same. So it is technically possible to switch games in the middle of a game, which is very strange. Um, so obviously you'd want to hit the reset button before starting a, uh, a new game. So let me go ahead and serve the ball here. Oh, that was uh, not very good. It's a lot harder to play uh, like this. Okay, let's see if I can... I'm going to see if I can get a stalemate condition. All right, so there we are. I've already replicated a stalemate condition, which is very easy to do with this game. It doesn't seem to have any advanced logic to automatically bounce the ball off slightly after so many uh, back and forth volleys like this. Increasing the ball speed doesn't make a change. And I actually do have it in the pro angle option right now. If I slow this back down and switch it to amateur, it might just change directions or not. So, again, it is very easy to, uh, to get stalemate conditions on this. Uh, squash is basically racquetball, so the players have to alternate turns bouncing the ball off of the wall. So I'll go ahead and give this a shot now. On some Pong cl uh, clones from back in the day, uh, I can remember an Odyssey 300 we had as a child that was basically almost exactly the same um, with the same game options. I want to say it actually did call it racquetball. Now see, it passed through this player because he had already previously uh, hit that. And then we have the practice mode, which is just for one person. Now the interesting thing about this practice mode is it actually uses the controller on the right side. The right side paddle uses this. That was interesting. Had a bit of a little graphic glitch there. Again, this does need uh, some of the contact points inside cleaned. Uh, I'm more amazed that the potentiometers appear to be good to go. And I think part of that is because when I took a look at them, the whole thing is made in Japan, which we all know, like Dave uh, Jones says from the EEV blog, all the best stuff's made in Japan. And in this particular case, I think it's true because I believe the pots are sealed. The uh, potentiometers for the controller knobs, they are sealed. So that is probably why they're working so well is because there hasn't been much air to get inside of them to oxidize the contacts over the years. So, yeah. So that's, uh, that's basically it. I'm, I'm, I'm losing against myself here because I'm just practicing. That's kind of interesting that you can, that's how I get a point is by just bouncing it and missing it. So yeah, again, it's just called practice. I guess the main idea is just to keep volleying it back and forth, obviously. I'm going to put it in pro mode on the angles to see if it makes a difference. Well, yeah, see, now we've got some, a little bit more, uh, yeah. Anyway, so that's that. Uh, that is the, uh, that's, that's the gameplay. So yeah, that's uh, that's a quick overview of this JC Penney's uh, TV four in one Pong clone uh, from sometime around the mid '70s. Again, if you have additional information that you can provide on this, or if you happen to own one yourself, I'd like to hear about it. Um, again, I can't find really anything on this at all, other than just a couple of pictures. And this video, as near as I can tell, is probably going to be the first video on YouTube about this as well, because again, I I can't find any references for this thing. Um, but yeah, what do I think of it? You know. I only have one other real Pong console clone. Well, that's not true. I've got a couple of others. Um, but I can tell you that I think this might be one of my favorite ones. The other one I have is made by the John Sands Electronic Company. It's called the John Sands uh, Electronic 2200. It's actually from a newer time frame, around 78, I think. Possibly even from 80. Um, and although that John Sands is a rare beast, to be sure, uh, it doesn't give me a very good picture, not like this thing does. And the paddles are very jittery, and they're just slider knobs versus actual uh, rotating knobs. Now, these knobs do not rotate all the way, by the way. Uh, they only go maybe about a quarter turn. 
uh, give or take. Yeah, they only give they only go about a quarter turn, but as you can see in the gameplay, it was more than enough to for the paddles to clear the whole screen. So yeah, thanks for uh, coming along and checking this out with me. It's a really cool thing. Um, the biggest challenge I'm going to have now with this is uh, where I'm going to find a, a place to put it because uh, it is a rather large box. Again, this is this is my hand span right here, and uh, yeah, it's it's one of the larger clon, uh, pong console consoles I have ever seen. Let me let me find my words. So, yeah, thanks again for hanging out and checking this out with me. See you next time.